video is brought to you by moviepalette.com. Hey everyone, do you have a favorite movie that you would love to hang on your wall, but you can't think of what scene or what poster to get? Well, now you can get the entire movie on one high quality canvas. With a moviepalette.com, you can get every scene from your favorite movie, or more specifically, the dominant color of every scene from your favorite movie in chronological order on a great high quality canvas. It also comes with a silver engraining uh, of the title down at the bottom. It has rubber stoppers on the back to keep it from bouncing. And they have a huge catalog uh, of what to choose from. Whether you're a horror fan or you're a fan of sci-fi, Marvel, uh, Japanese anime, Disney animation, drama, or Oscar classics, there's a movie palette for you. Uh, and right now, moviepalette.com is having a sale for 50% off for their Halloween sale. But if you go right now and if you enter room 15, if you enter room 15, you'll get 15% off of the movie palette of your choice. That's R O O M 1 5 for 15% off of your movie palette. Again, this is a great value for a great piece of home decor that that looks great for uh, for any film and for any film buff and anywhere in your home. You, you will definitely like this product. Mine is of The Shining, and I cannot be happy uh, happier with it. So, so definitely go to moviepalette.com and enter R O O M one five for fifty percent off of your palette. Hey, horror fans! Welcome back to Road Two Three Seven. Back with another review. And originally, I was hoping tonight to do a review of the A twenty four film Lamb which was one of the last ones that I had to do. It was the last A24 film that I was waiting on. <clears throat> had some issues with the DVD. I, I've got to return it. It drives me nuts because it's one that I've been wanting to see forever. So I figured, what the hell, I'll just continue my month of October Stephen King run through. And that's what this is a part of. And since I was so pissed off about Lamb not being able to see that, Figured I'd do one of my favorite Stephen King films. Uh, this is, without a doubt, in the top 10 favorite Stephen King films. And, without a doubt, in my top 10 best of adaptations. Like, from novel to screen. <clears throat> and this is one of the first DVDs I ever got. Uh, up until I was 11, I had VHS tapes. My first DVD ever when I was 11 was Creepshow. And then the next Christmas, I got a couple more. And this very DVD was one of them. And it was the first ever Stephen King film adaptation, 1976's Carrie. Now, yes, this is an older DVD. I know there's, I think there's one by Shout Factory. There's one by Arrow, I believe. So there are some newer releases, but I'm still fine with this. <clears throat> yeah, first ever Stephen King adaptation based on his first ever published novel. Yeah, this is just a crappy paperback I have. This is one of the few I don't have a first edition hardcover of. I would absolutely love to have a first edition of this because it is one of my favorite Stephen King books as well. But it does come with a picture of the original cover. So there's that at least. Uh, directed by one of my favorite filmmakers of all time, uh, Brian De Palma. Known for his horror and thriller films, his crime and gangster flicks. I'm a fan of Brian De Palma. This w would probably be one of my favorite films of his. Side note, a number of his films have been called Giallo, which first of all, they're American films, so they can't be Giallo. But they're inspired by the formula. Even though when he did Dress to Kill, he wasn't even aware of Giallo. But people like to call Dress to Kill Giallo. But there's also Blowout and Body Double that people call Giallo, even though they're not. I love Blowout. Really like Dress to Kill. <clears throat> also known for being the first film for John Travolta. Also stars uh, Sissy Spacek and Piper Laurie. Both of which were nominated for the Oscar for this. Uh, Sissy Spacek for Best Actress. Piper Laurie for Best Supporting Actress. I really think Piper Laurie should have won. 
I have not seen the film Network, so I I don't know if that actress uh, deserved it, but Jodie Foster was also nominated for Taxi Driver. But Piper Laurie as Margaret White is one of my favorite performances by an actress and one of my favorite female villains, along with uh, 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 Andy Wilkes and Nurse Ratched. <clears throat> and, I mean, it, it's one of the greatest... Uh, revenge stories ever one of the best high school horror movies ever I mean it definitely one of the best horror movies dealing with especially revenge in the terms of like uh, teenage cruelty or bullying and <clears throat> yes this has been remade a few times uh, there was the 2002 TV movie with Angela Bettis as Carrie, which I have not seen. And then the 2013 piece of crap with Chloe Grace Moretz, which I have reviewed. This is the best Carrie. Then there's Rage Carrie too, which isn't even a thing. But yes, this is a horror movie first and foremost. Uh, I've had several conversations with people who say this is not a horror film. It's a drama with a horror movie ending, which is... The biggest load of shit I've ever heard. Just because a movie is slower or maybe doesn't have as many horror scenes, it doesn't make it any less of a horror film. <clears throat> Especially where the whole movie is build up like this one is. I have read some, some of the negative reviews from the 70s that say this is lacking style and that the climax was just crude and clumsy and sloppy. I, I don't know what movie they saw because this movie has style written all over it. Brian De Palma, I, one of the greatest filmmakers, especially to come out of the 70s, late 60s into the 70s. This has all of his tropes that make his movie so stylish. The... Uh, I keep forgetting what it's called, even though I just watched the special feature on this. That dual focus, where this is an earlier film that has that, so you have someone in the foreground, people in the background, but they're both in focus. Uh, Dialoptic, I think it was called. This is an earlier film, so it's kind of fuzzy around the person in the foreground, but it still looks great. Also has that comic panel split screen that I think really works. Uh, you have really interesting camera angles, especially within the White House, where Carrie lives, where things are not really centered, shots look off-center, or they're kind of tilted, or at weird uh, upward angles, kind of to make it a disorienting. And then the tracking shots, which I am always a sucker for. The uninterrupted tracking shot, which goes on for like three, three and a half minutes at the prom when it shows us, you know, the rig with the pig blood. One of my favorite tracking shots ever. I'm a huge sucker for long, uninterrupted shots. <clears throat> the best one being the uh, uh, Copacabana entrance in Goodfellas, but this is up there. It has a ton of style. And then when you get that lighting at prom, where it just all goes red. Now, <clears throat> there are some, some differences with the novel, but very little. I mean, <clears throat> there's the kind of backstory showing Carrie when she's younger. Like when she sees the sunbathing neighbor, her mother gets mad at her and she makes it rain stones. Apparently that was shot, but not used. Which, oddly enough, during the ending of the film, when the house is imploding, the interiors were already shot, so we see rocks coming through. But since the whole raining boulders hadn't been established yet, it does feel kind of random. That was always something I didn't really like. <clears throat> but more so in this, especially with the exterior shots, it does look more like the house is just imploding on itself and sinking. So that saved that idea. 
<clears throat> and I mean, the story is very simple. Well, first I got to go through everything else. So yeah, uh, directed by Brian De Palma. Again, one of his best films, at least in my opinion. Uh, I mean, I love love Blowout. Really like Dress to Kill. Of course, uh, really like uh, uh, Raising Cane. I think that's an underrated thriller. Then you have all of his, you know, gangster flicks. Scarface, Untouchables, Carlito's Way. All great. Uh, written by Lawrence D. Cohen, or at least he did the screenplay. Stars uh, Sissy Spacek and Piper Laurie, as I've said. John Travolta's first movie. P.J. Souls, who would go on to play Linda in Halloween. Uh, Nancy Allen, who would go on to be in Dress to Kill and Blowout. I think Body Double, but I know Dress to Kill and Blowout. Uh, uh, Amy Irving, uh, Betty Buckley, William Catt, who would go on to be in House, a fun 80s film. <clears throat> and uh, Sissy Spacek actually got the role because her husband, Jack Fisk, was the art director. And he convinced her to audition. She made herself look all homely, and she got it. Also, Amy Irving's real-life mother plays her character's uh, mom as well. Uh, Mario Tosi did the cinematography, and uh, Pino DiNaggio did the music, who would go on to do a number of films of uh, De Palma's, mostly his uh, thrillers. <clears throat> and this movie has... It, it, it was... Quite a gross, too. I mean, made for 1.8 million, grossed 33.8, so it was a hit. Nominated at the Oscars for Best Actress, Supporting Actress. I mean, it, it's known as one of the best horror movies of the 70s. So, anyone saying this is not a horror movie, uh, just go back to your Blumhouse where you have a jump scare every five seconds. But I mean, Tarantino says this isn't his top 10 favorite movies. Stephen King says it's dated, but he still thinks it's a good film. Uh, I remember it being in the top 10 of Bravo's 100 Scariest uh, Movie Moments. And yeah, uh, as far as the 70s go, I would put this up there as important and best with The Omen, The Exorcist, uh, even important films that really propelled the genre more like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Halloween, Jaws. It it really is just a beautifully crafted it, it's a beautifully crafted film that's very well acted. And the build up is really what helps sell it. I mean, this poor young girl, Carrie White, played by SpaceX, she's picked on at school. You know, she wears raggedy clothes she looks unkempt now in the book she's described as being uh, overweight having some acne and this one guy i've had a conversation with because i said why cast chloe grace moretz as carrie in the remake when she looks like she should be one of the popular girls and all they really do is mess her hair up a little bit she does not look like an ugly duckling outcast at all and this one guy said well they're not gonna cast an, an overweight girl covered in acne i mean uh, who wants to see that that's why movies suck now because of audience members like you like yes sissy spacek is not overweight covered in acne but they do a good job at making her look like that ugly duckling outcast so that when you get to prom you see how beautiful she is. That's Carrie. Where with Chloe Grace Moretz, all she does is comb her hair and put makeup on. It's not much of a drastic change. So she's picked on at school. The whole school hates her. Uh, her mom is played by Piper Laurie, played brilliantly by Piper Laurie, is a complete psychotic religious a fanatic who even punishes her for getting her period saying that it's a sin to even have your period 
<clears throat> which the film even opens with her getting her period and her never being told what that was. And Brian De Palma's idea, well, one, to have the opening be a volleyball game during gym, where he had that awesome overhead shot that just comes and zooms in on her as she loses the game. Leading into the locker room scene where there's a bunch of nudity. The idea behind it was, one, to have a nude scene that early in the film was to show audiences that this is a movie that's going to just go for it and you won't know what to expect. And the way it's in slow motion and the beautiful music is supposed to be more uh, uh, sensual, but then you just get to this freak out where she has her period and they're just throwing tampons at her, at her saying plug it up. Just, again, that drastic change, which works. And so the girls are punished. And this one girl, Sue, played by Amy Irving, she asks her boyfriend, Tommy Ross, uh, played by uh, William Cattell, to take Carrie to the prom. And Tommy Ross is known as the most popular guy in school, so she thinks she's doing her a favor. Meanwhile, this other girl, Chris Hagen, played by Nancy Allen, uh, she's pissed that she got a detention because of Carrie, blames Carrie for it. <clears throat> so she rigs this whole prank to make it so Carrie and Tommy win prom king and queen so that they go up on the stage. She'll, she'll pull a rope in a bucket of pig blood that she got, you know, straight from the pig with her boyfriend, John Travolta's help. Pig blood falls on her in front of everybody and she's humiliated. But the catch is Carrie has telekinesis and she does spend most of the movie kind of figuring out that she has it. Now, it doesn't have X-Men scenes like in the re it's not a remake. I take that back. People call it a remake. It's just a newer adaptation of the book. <clears throat> the sort of X-Men scenes where she's practicing how to use it, which looks stupid. I know it's in the book, but it looks stupid in the movie. That's the final straw. And she kills everyone at prom. And then goes home, has to face her mother, who's had a complete psychotic breakdown. And what makes it work, other than just being a good story, which that's one thing about especially classic King, his concepts are always very interesting. And can sell you know he's <clears throat> his books always have a very good concept just sometimes the execution doesn't always follow through i have read the book i read it years ago so i don't really remember a lot i do remember the differences i do remember it has more of like a journalistic type format but brian de palma's direction and the performances and the music re is really what makes this movie stand out. And what makes it you know, one of the best horror movies in the 70s. What it, and definitely a top three or top five at least favorite Stephen King film and favorite Stephen King adaptation of mine. I mean, yeah, you do have those uh, dual focus you know, shots. There's a lot of those, especially the scene where this one, one English teacher, which I, I can never remember his last name. His first name is Sidney. He's one of my favorite character, a uh, uh, Sidney Lassick as uh, Mr. Fromm. He played Cheswick in One Floor of the Cuckoo's Nest. He would go on to be in the underrated slasher film, uh, The Unseen. Uh, just excellent character actor. <clears throat> Going over Tommy's poem in class and Carrie sitting behind him. So you get this crazy close-up of Tommy, Carrie in the background. They're both in focus. But I really like this sort of comic panel split screens at the prom. And again, those uninterrupted uh, tracking shots. Like where we see 
uh, Chris and uh, Billy, played by John Travolta, peeking out from underneath the stage. And the camera just looks over to PJ Souls as she flips, uh, switches out the, the ballads for King and Queen, walks over to drop off the ballads, kind of give them the okay, then look up to the bucket of blood, they kind of peer over the stage, and then back down and over to Carrie and Tommy. Excellent. And there's a lot going on in that scene too, and I guess it took almost a whole day of rehearsals because just everything the crane had to do and all these marks for all the different actors, there's a lot going on rather than just an uninterrupted shot. It looks great. It's very hypnotic. It pulls you in. I think everything that they had to take out or change worked better for the film. Like I know in the book, she kills her mother and then kills <clears throat> Chris and Billy uh, in their car when this is reversed. And she kills her mother last. Which I also love. This movie has one of the creepiest shots I think in any Stephen King movie sure but like every time I see it it's just as unsettling as the first time I saw it and again this is how you can do a scare with no you know crazy zoom or loud sting of music and for years I mean I, I first saw this when I was like eight or nine I got the DVD when I was 12, but for years, I think I was like 19 or 20 the first time I noticed it. When Karen comes home from the prom, she's covered in blood, and you know, you get that great music, which I'll talk about the inside of the house, because the interior of the White House is claustrophobic and atmospheric. It's got this gothic look to it. And just with that one piece of music put over to it as she's walking through. When she gets to the top of the stairs to go into the bathroom to take a bath. And you kind of just see this figure standing behind the door. And Carrie just walks by. And the camera follows her. She flicks on the light. For a quick second behind the door, you just see her mother. Just standing there wide-eyed. Completely motionless. Almost like that uh, torso uh, mannequin on a stand that you make a, a clothes on, which is right next to her. She's just as motionless as that. But the way the camera just pulls up, she's just... I didn't notice it for years. And it's definitely the, cr the creepiest shot in the whole movie. I mean, <clears throat> that's why I call it the creep factor, where... You have something in the background. You don't have to make the audience know it's there. It's creepier and scarier when you don't fucking do that. I mean, it's like the shots in Halloween when Annie's in the kitchen, but Michael's, you know, standing outside the window. Yeah, I love that shot. Definitely the scariest shot. Now, if it was a Blumhouse film, and even the 2013 movie did this, just... Everything is just loud and in your face, telling you to be scared. <clears throat> but then the shots, you know, when her mother just finally stabs her, she falls down the stairs, and you, you kind of get this sort of cockeyed, angled, upward shot that's kind of shaky of her mother just coming down the stairs. That looks great. And... This whole movie's awesome. I'm, I'm really not... This is one of those movies I don't really know what to say because it's all positive. And it's one of those movies where everyone knows the story. Really just got to talk about stuff that, you know, film-wise, what works. There are a couple things. Like, there are a couple cheesy moments. Like, when it shows her getting ready for the prom and Tommy and his pals getting ready. There is this kind of goofy score. And even when they're trying on tuxedos, the video 
speeds up and they get kind of that fast uh, uh, chipmunk uh, VCR sound. I'm guessing just to speed up the scene. That totally always felt off. But, yeah. And I know, I've talked to people who said that scene ruined the movie for because it was too goofy. I thought I was intolerant, but it's beautifully shot, beautifully stylized. I mean, there are a lot of overhead shots that look great. Um, now, yes, it... It did work better to kind of downplay a lot of stuff. Because, like, in the book, Carrie destroys the whole town. Here, she really just destroys the high school and everyone in it. I think that works more. Because uh, I think of the book, and also I think of the 2013 movie. It shows that this whole town hates the whites. So she kind of gets this revenge on everyone. And in the 2013 movie, she's doing this Fantasia, like, like, kind of like a, a wizard or something. But here, it is creepier, just Sissy Spacek, just wide-eyed, just, she looks, makes something happen, looks, makes something happen, and just walking, just stiff and wide-eyed. That's creepier than Chloe Grace Moretz, just doing this like weird like contorted walking and just like whew. and I also read this thing of how people in the 2013 movie were asking like how did you get the blood to land on her and look so perfect because if you remember the blood is so perfectly applied so you can still see certain parts of her face and Brian De Palma just says we had our art director, Jack Fisk, stand on a ladder, dump blood on her. It was that simple. Also, like, the definition of build-up is this long scene with just one piece of music when they're announced as king and queen of the prom. And th they rise from their seat, they're walking through the crowd, it's their POV with everyone clapping and smiling at them. It, the music is, you know, the swollen, big music. It's very happy and beautiful sounding. Then they walk up the stage, and we get Chris and Billy's POV, and it's just that, do 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 But then we see them on stage. It's all happy again. And the music is building up, building, building, building. As Sue, who's standing behind the stage watching, realizes the rope, is going up to the bucket of blood, going back down, and the music is just. Duh, duh. Can't remember how it goes, but it, it's the same key as when everything was happy, but it's getting more. It's building up more and more, getting more and more sinister, until it, just doing that like. Until she finally pulls it. And yeah, I would say Sue did take a little too long to piece everything together. She could have figured it out sooner, ran up, pushed Carrie out of the way, or just point to the gym teacher like, hey, someone. But then what's also very effective is once the blood drops on her, total dead silence. And I'm, I'm guessing it's to capture the deafening silence that would have happened in a situation like that. So you you just hear the uh, dripping sounds, the clanging uh, of the bucket, and it's just so echoey because the silence is just so thick that even when Tommy yells, like, we don't hear that, but just the sound of that dripping blood and the clanging of the bucket, even when it falls and hits him in the head, just that loud echo throughout the room that's very effective and then it goes into like this kaleidoscope vision as she looks at certain people it hears lines from previously like they're all gonna laugh at you gym teacher trust me carrie 
of them all laughing at her. Now, some people have said, I've read in comments, like, how dare the gym teacher laugh at her? Like, she, she trusted her. The kaleidoscope vision is her broken mind. The gym teacher is not laughing at her. It's just, literally, she's breaking and snapping. And everyone is laughing at her, but not the gym teacher. That's just... That's just to show how far her mind has gone. And yes, the gym teacher lives in the book, dies in this, which is a good way to show no one is safe. And I, I will say the 2013 movie does make the Chris character more despicable. But I think a lot of that is she's just like a modern Gen Z social media kid. So... <clears throat> Whereas here, she's just like the perfect bitch. And yeah, this is early John Travolta, so it's kind of like the... Uh, yeah, yeah, oh, oh my god, yeah, John Travolta. Like, but, <clears throat> you know, it's stylish as hell. I love the style. And every bit of it he did. I love the music. Best piece of music is either the build-up to the blood dripping or the blood pouring or when she first gets home which I don't remember which part of the prom it is will be cut back to show that her mother has finally snapped as well it is just this again cockeyed off center overhead view of the kitchen with her pacing around the table then she goes to the cutting board to cut carrots then the carrots gone and she's just hitting against the cutting board but I love when she gets home and it just, it looks like a gothic church, like with a, a monastery amount of candles. The thresholds had that gothic uh, 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 archways. Again, her closet is creepy. It, it is a sketchy looking closet. Something about that Jesus statue, something about its eyes, like its eyes are glowing or something. But everything about this movie is effective again yeah the the rocks at least with the interior shots the rocks falling through might not make sense but that was because they didn't use the scene from when she was younger but at least with the exteriors due to issues with everything they just made the house implode which does make more sense now the ending with Carrie's hand, the Sue's dream of her putting flowers down on the rubble and Carrie's bloody arm coming up to grab her was inspired by the ending to Deliverance and inspired Tom Savini to come up to pitch the idea to Sean Cunningham for the ending to Friday the 13th. <clears throat> and, you know, it works. It's one of the best jump scare endings ever. It, especially one of my favorites. Uh, again, I, I like how they limited the destruction to pretty much just the high school. Uh, I love the red lighting. Like, which he's kind of... And you can definitely see Brian De Palma's influence of psycho in this every thriller or horror movie he does there's elements of psycho he's always wanted you know his psycho here i i think it's the music because earlier scenes which he uses her telekinesis it does have that like ding 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 the chi 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 re 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 uh, however it goes you know, like when she breaks the mirror or when she shuts the windows with her yelling at her mother. Which, side note, when her and her mother are at the dinner table and you got that Last Supper rug on the wall, I think that's the only real, like, centered shot in the whole house or of all the scenes in the house. Everything else feels off center and just not normal. Like, which really captures the tone and atmosphere of life in that house. 
But yeah, so I think that was his psycho influence was the music. So after the pig blood falls on her, and she makes all the lights go out, you know, all the doors lock, everything's like a shing, shing, shing. And then when she looks down at the lights, it makes them all go red up close in her eyes. Or I, I love how the sound changes. It's like shing, 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 boom. I love the look of the red. And again, her just walking stiffly like that with wide eyes, way scarier than <sighs> fucking dumb as hell. But yeah, I I absolutely love this movie. Uh, this would have to be in my top three favorite Stephen King movies behind The Shining and Misery. Probably top three best adaptations. Maybe my second favorite adaptation behind, uh, behind uh, Misery. Maybe uh, the 2013 film is closer, and I've heard 2002 might even be the closest. I'm not sure if the Broadway show is still going on. Or maybe not Broadway, but the state, stage musical. I would love to see that. But you you can definitely see how a filmmaker like Brian De Palma and a cast like this really has a whole lot to say about making this story work. I mean, 2013 failed miserably. Far superior film. Uh, I love it to death. When I was younger, I, I thought it was a good movie, but I thought maybe it was a little slow. Maybe it took too long. I really was just waiting until prom. Now I love and appreciate the whole movie. I mean, every scene is important, and it is one big build up to the prom. And I mean, this movie's known for its prom sequence, which is really 20 minutes, I think. So really just 20 minutes of film that kind of helps define 1970s horror. I mean, it's it's that much of a legacy. And just everything is so meticulous. Also, just that little symbolism of Sue realizing what's going to happen if she looks up at the rope, looks back down. Sees the silhouette of Chris holding it. Then she looks back up. And she just sees one small ribbon that like fell from the rafters. Drift down right over Carrie. And that kind of symbolizes to her what's going to happen. And a good foreshadowing to us as well. Even though, because it never says we want to do this to her. This is our plan. We kind of get the idea, but that... Let's her know and us at the same time fully realize. And it's just as suspenseful as the first time I saw it. I mean, the whole with Sue realizing everything and trying to stop it, it the way the music builds up, just as suspenseful as any other time I've watched it. Very solid film. Definitely one of my favorites. And again... Definitely one of my favorite Stephen King films and adaptations. Top three for both of those. Excellent movie. And whoever says this is not a horror movie, again, one, reevaluate yourself. And two, I guess, stick with your Blumhouse, your Paranormal Activities, your your Annabelle's and Ouija's and Bye Bye Man's and crap that sucks. Excellent movie. I love it. So, <clears throat> I'm hoping to return Lamb and get one that I can actually watch. Uh, I will be picking up uh, Bodies, 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 which I think comes out on the 8th. Then I'll be doing all the A24 uh, ranking videos. I will check out some new releases. I know Mr. Harrigan's phone, I think, is out tonight on Netflix, actually. I'll be checking that out soon. Uh, I will check out the new Hellraiser at some point, but I do have more Stephen King films to get to, so uh, stay tuned for those. And uh, sorry this video was a little longer, but anyway, uh, thank you for watching. Oh!